Korean Airlines Flight 007 Alternative theories concerns the various theories put forward regarding the shooting down of Korean Airlines Flight 007. The aircraft was en route from New York City via Anchorage to Seoul on September 1, 1983, when it strayed into prohibited Soviet airspace and was shot down by Soviet jet fighters. Flight 007 has been the subject of ongoing controversy and has spawned a number of conspiracy theories. Many of these are based on the suppression of evidence such as the flight data recorders, unexplained details such as the role of a USAF RC-135 surveillance aircraft, or merely Cold War disinformation and propaganda. Some commentators also felt that the International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO report into the incident failed to address key points adequately, such as the reason for the aircraft's deviation. The release of flight data recorder evidence by the Russian Federation in 1993, ten years after the event, seriously challenged many of these theories. Some alternative interpretations focus on evidential questions largely independent of political considerations. One of the first theories was that Space Shuttle Challenger and a satellite were monitoring the airliner's progress over Soviet territory. Defense Attaché, which printed this claim, was sued by Korean Airlines and forced to pay damages and print an apology. Topic. Flight crew awareness of deviation The reasons put forward for the aircraft's deviation range from a lack of situational awareness by the pilots ICAO, to a planned and intentional deviation Pearson, to an inertial navigation system INS, programming error by 10 degrees of longitude during the inputting of the ramp starting position by the crew. All accounts note that the pilots had several sources of information that could have alerted them to their increasing deviation from their planned route. The H.E. scenario additionally suggests the flight's first officer did know they were flying away from the planned course, but the airline's culture discouraged anyone from questioning the captain's conduct of the flight, so he remained silent. The theory that the end system was set incorrectly gains considerable credibility if the following are considered. Although there are three independent inertial platforms, when in the ramp position, the operator only inputs one initial position in order for the platform to erect. This would have been done by the flight engineer alone, before the other crew members arrive. In order to erect properly, that is, enter Euro compassing mode, each platform relies on the correct latitude, but not the longitude. Therefore, if the longitude was incorrectly set, all three platforms would seem to erect normally, but with a position some 10 degrees in error, once airborne, an incorrect aircraft system position of at higher latitudes a small amount would immediately direct all the flight navigational displays to fly the aircraft to what it thinks is the correct track to the first way point. Once on the wrong track, all would appear normal, HSIs included. This would even be true if there were pictorial navigational displays, similar to modern aircraft. The deviated track can be compared with the required track. As the aircraft moves south, the lines of longitude expand and the track deviation gets greater. That is the initial 10 degree error that was sent to the ends gets wider. The horizontal situation indicator she, Pearson contends that the HSI's needle could have alerted the pilots of their course deviation. He postulates that the needle of each pilot's she, capable of showing deviation only up to 8 nautical miles 15 kilometers, should have been pegged all the way to the side. The pilots, thus, could in theory have known that they were at least 8 nautical miles 15 kilometers off course, despite this, at 1349 UTC, the pilots were reporting that they were on course, 007, Bethel at 49er, 
50 minutes after takeoff, military radar at King Salmon, Alaska acquired Cal 007 at more than 12.6 nautical miles .3 kilometers off course. The deviation exceeded the expected accuracy of the INS 2 nautical miles 3.7 kilometers an hour by a factor of 6 difficulties in making required reports pilot and copilot could also have been aware of the aircraft's serious deviation because now much more than 12 nautical miles 22 kilometers off course Cal 007 was too far off course for the pilots to make their required very high frequency VHF radio reports, and had to relay these reports via Cal Flight 015, just minutes behind and on course Cal 007, increasingly off course, relied on Cal 015 three times to relay its reports to Anchorage Air Traffic Control. By being forced to rely on Cal 015 to relay messages, Cal 007 should have by definition understood that they were well off course. At one point in this section of its flight, 1443 UTC, Cal 007 put a call through a navigational hookup, the International Flight Service Station on HF. Flight 007, now too distant to speak directly with Anchorage controller through VHF, was transmitting its message using HF. At another point of this section of the flight, at waypoint NABIE, Cal 007 was too far north to make radio contact with the VHF air traffic control relay station on St. Paul Island. Cal 015 relayed for Cal 007. The message was a change in the estimated time of arrival ETA for the next waypoint called Neva, delaying by four minutes the ETA that Cal 015 had previously relayed on behalf of Cal 007. Since a revised ETA could only be calculated by means of readout information presented by Cal 07's Inertial Navigation Systems Control Display Unit, Pearson asserts that pilot and copilot were once again presented with the opportunity of verifying their position and becoming aware of their enormous deviation. Contrary wind conditions of Cal 007 and Cal 015. Cal 015 had departed about 15 minutes behind Cal 007. About 23 minutes before the tragedy, the two aircraft compared the times that they expected to reach waypoint NOKKA, at which point it became apparent that Cal 015 would reach it only four minutes behind Cal 007. Cal 015 reported experiencing strong tailwinds, while Cal 007 was experiencing a headwind. The paradox of the different flying conditions experienced by two aircraft supposedly flying so close together was discussed in the cabin of Cal 007, but the crew failed to draw any conclusions from it. Weather radar, there was one last aid to warn the crew. Displayed in consoles at the knees of both pilot and copilot, the plane's weather radar could have alerted them, both over Kamchatka and later over Sakhalin, to the fact that they were no longer flying over water, as they should have been. Weather radar has two modes. Ground mapping, when it would be possible to look down and see water or land masses as well as the contours of the coast lines, and weather surveillance mode for thunderstorm detection. In ground mapping mode, Cal 007 had only to make sure that the land mass of Kamchatka and the island string of the curl chain would remain to the right. That night, Cal 07's weather radar was probably not in land mapping mode, for the weather was inclement. The ICAO's meteorological analysis concluded that there was extensive coverage of low, medium, and high-level clouds over southern Kamchatka associated with an active cold front. ICAO's analysis of Cal 07's weather radar functioning would state, it was concluded that the radar was not functioning properly or that the ground mapping capability was not used. 
According to the ICAO, an indicator of pilot unawareness of the deviation from route of their flight was the bantering and casual cockpit conversation at the times that awareness of deviation into hostile airspace would have increased tension and have precluded this. See Korean Airlines Flight 007 transcripts. Topic. Planned spy mission theory In 1994, Robert W. Allardyce and James Gollan wrote Desired Track, The Tragic Flight of Cal Flight 007, supporting the spy mission theory. In 2007, they reiterated their position in a series of articles in Airways magazine, arguing that the investigation by the International Civil Aviation Organization was a cover-up of a carefully planned ferret mission. Furthermore, they suggested that the NSA had implemented electronic countermeasures to cover for the mission and that the flight recorder tapes had been planted for the Soviet recovery effort to find. Planned spy mission theories point out the incongruency of a civilian passenger liner going accidentally astray and unnoticed precisely in one of the most militarily sensitive and well observed areas in the Cold War. They point out that there were powerful land and sea radar arrays that could well have tracked Cal 007 as it crossed through the NORAD prohibited to civilian flight zone and approached and entered Soviet territory. These were Cobra Judy aboard the missile range instrumentation ship USNS Observation Island, then off the coast of Kamchatka. Simia Island's Cobra Dane line of sight radar with the capability of tracking an aircraft at up to a 30,000 feet 9, meters altitude through an area covering 400 miles 640 kilometers, the curvature of the Earth being its limiting factor. Simia Island's Cobra Talon, an over-the-horizon radar array with a range from 575 miles 925 kilometers to 2,070 miles 3,330 kilometers. Cobra Talon operated by bouncing its emissions off the ionosphere deflection to the other side of the line of sight horizon, thus acquiring its targets. These radar arrays had capability for both surveillance and tracking. Whether this capability was actually used in the case of Flight 007 is currently unknown. In addition, the United States Air Force radar stations at Cape Newenham and Cape Romanzov, two of 12 stations comprising the United States Alaskan Distant Early Warning, Aircraft Control and Warning do, ACW, system, had the capability to track all aircraft heading toward the Russian buffer zone. Well within range of these radar sites, Cal 007 had veered directly toward Kamchatka. This theory postulates that the CIA put out disinformation about the aircraft landing at Sakhalin after their mission failed in order to buy time to construct a more credible story. Topic: Theory of intentional deviation by pilots. This theory, promoted by David Pearson in his book Cal 007, the cover-up postulates that the pilots made a deliberate, carefully planned intrusion into Soviet territory with the knowledge of U.S. military and intelligence agencies. He argues that it was impossible for the pilots not to know that they were off course. Various mechanisms, such as the horizontal situation indicator, should, assuming that the aircraft's navigation systems were functional and correctly programmed, have alerted the pilots of their course deviation. In addition, VHF transmissions to Anchorage had to be relayed via flight Cal 015, which should have been a few minutes behind Cal 007, had it been on course, because the plane had traveled too far off course. 
Pearson has also questioned why, if the pilots had unintentionally strayed off course, a USRC-135 reconnaissance plane in the area did not see the jumbo jet or pick up the Soviet radio chatter regarding it and warn it of its danger, as well as informing its own command and civilian air traffic controllers. The theory of intentional deviation suffered a blow in 1992 with the handover by the Russian Federation of the cockpit voice recorder tape. This showed that at the times of most danger during the flight, the flight crew was relaxed speaking about currency exchange at Kimpo Airport, or board, or even bantering with each other, indicating to ICAO analysts that the crew of Cal 007 were unaware of the danger they were then exposed to. Murray Sale described an earlier version of Pearson's theory published in The Nation as containing schoolboy howlers, or, better, graduate student howlers, regarding the operation of cockpit positioning monitors, and Pearson's approach in general as lacking objectivity, and the work of a conspiracy theorist. Topic. Theory of spy mission involving USAF aircraft Another theory was suggested by a French aeronautical expert, Michel Brun, in his book Incident at Sakhalin, the true mission of Cal Flight 007. It has been supported by a former American diplomat to Moscow, John Keppel, and the American Association Foundation for Constitutional Government. According to this book, the USSR was not guilty. The massacre of Flight 007 was directly caused by the Americans or Japanese. Cal 007 was involved in a spy mission intended to trigger Soviet air defenses and to cover up for the missions of several USAF surveillance aircraft. Soviet fighters attacked these aircraft but did not destroy Cal 007 which crashed far away from Sakhalin in Japanese. Friendly territory in the Japanese Sea near North Honshu. The Korean aircraft was correctly communicating with other CAL crews, 46 minutes after the official time of the shootdown. A large air battle allegedly occurred between the Soviet Air Force and the USAF, during which the Soviets shot down several American aircraft, including an RC-135, an EF-111 and probably even an State Route 71. The Su-15 pilot, Major Osipovich, flew two sorties and shot down two targets contradicted by the 1991 interview with Osipovich. Furthermore, for a long time all the experts believed that the Soviet fighter pilot was called Major Kazman. Michel Brun believes that Kazman and Osipovich twice destroyed an aircraft, but absolutely not the Cal 007. According to the theory, the whereabouts of the KAL 007 wreckage is not known to anyone, but is probably 500 kilometers (310 miles) away from Monoron Island down the coast of Japan. The theory postulates further that the real cause of the destruction is not known, but could have been a surface-to-air missile fired from USS Badger, similar case with USS Vincennes shooting down of Iran Air Flight 655 or from Japanese forces, who could not identify the airliner which was keeping radio silence. In March 1991 an anonymous Japanese pilot said on TV that he knew who was guilty, a colleague who became a taxi driver in Tokyo. The lack of bodies, body parts, and wreckage of Cal 007 around Sakhalin and Monoron Islands was an indication to Brun that Cal 007 did not come down in those locales. Sparse remains showing up on the beaches of Hokkaido, nine days after the destruction of Cal 007 south of Monoron and Sakhalin, are evidence to Brun that Cal 007 was down further south and that these remains were brought northward by the north-running Tsushima current along the west Japanese coast. 
This opposes the commonly held understanding that the remains were carried from the waters near the islands of Sakhalin and Monoron by the West Sakhalin current flowing south between the two islands at 1 mile per hour, 1.6 kilometers per hour, then by the West Sakhalin convergent current, 6.9 to 8.1 miles per hour, 11 to 13 kilometers per hour near the tip of Sakhalin, 35 nautical miles away from Monoron into the Soya Strait. Strait, and finally onto the beaches of Hokkaido. Brun also discovered that Cal 007 communicated by radio in Korean with two other Korean aircraft after 3.27, the official time of its destruction, at 3.54 with Cal 015, 4.10 with KE-50, and twice at 4.13, the true time of the aircraft crashing. This unusual last call, which was sent to the two aircraft and suddenly cut, could probably be explained by a serious problem occurring. In his book, Brunn published a photograph of a weapon found by Japanese sailors from JMSA among Cal 007 debris, north of Monoron Island on 10 September 1983, bearing the mark N3. The letter N does not exist in the Russian Cyrillic alphabet, suggesting that the weapon was not Soviet. Brun's theory attempts to account for the only eyewitness report of an explosion near Monoron Island which is considered to be that of Cal 007 on its way to the water. A Japanese fisherman aboard the Chidori Maru 58 had reported to the Japanese Maritime Safety Agency and this report was forgotten in 1984 but cited by the ICAO analysis in 1993 of hearing a plane at low altitude but not seeing it. Then he heard a loud sound followed by a bright flash of light on the horizon, then another dull sound and a less intense flash of light on the horizon." As well as smelling aviation fuel, Brunn maintains that the fisherman's account of the destruction of Cal 007 was not sustainable because if the aircraft exploded while low on the horizon, the sound of the explosion could not have, as reported by the fisherman, reached his ear before the flash of the explosion reached the eye, as light travels faster than sound. Brunn further maintains, in accordance with his theory of an aerial combat between Russian and U.S. aircraft, that the loud sound heard prior to the flash of light on the horizon could have been the sound of a missile fired by a military jet flying above or near the Chidori Maru 58, at an opposing military jet, the explosion of which was seen by the fishermen, and wrongly attributed by ICAO analysts to Cal 007, which Brunn believes went down in Japanese waters much further south of Monoron at 4 hours 13 minutes and 16 seconds s. Among Michel Brun's supporters since 1995 is David Pearson, author of Cal 007, The Cover-Up. Theories about lack of human remains and luggage at impact site These theories attempt to explain why there were no surface finds at the place postulated for the Cal 07's impact with the water. There were no bodies, body parts, or body tissues, and there was no luggage. Furthermore, on the sea bottom there was only one partial torso and ten body parts or tissues, possibly from the same individual, noted by Soviet civilian divers who had commenced diving to the wreckage purported to be of Cal 007 just two weeks after the shootdown. Furthermore, for all of the 269 occupants, divers reported with surprise either no luggage or, in one diver's report, there were only a few pieces of luggage at the bottom. Of the 13 body parts or tissues washed up on the Japanese Hokkaido beaches 70 miles from Soviet Monoron Island and starting eight days after the shoot down, all were unidentifiable. 
All the non-human items see main article recovered from Hokkaido's beaches were those generally coming from a passenger cabin of an aircraft and none from the cargo hold, contrary to what would be expected if there had been a total destruction from a passenger aircraft crashing into the sea. Topic. Crab theory In his book The Mystery of Korean Boeing 747, Soviet correspondent Andrei Illich proposes that the bodies were eaten by giant crabs. The crab theory has been persistent and been echoed by the Soviet interceptor pilot Gennady Osipovich, who fired the missile that shot down the plane. I heard that they had found the Boeing when I was still on Sakhalin. And even investigated it. But no one saw people there. I, however, explained that by the fact that there are crabs in the sea off Sakhalin that immediately devour everything. I did hear that they found only a hand in a black glove. Perhaps it was the hand of the pilot of the aircraft that I shot down. You know, even now I cannot really believe that there were passengers on board. You cannot write off everyone to the crabs. Surely something would be left. Nevertheless, I am a supporter of the old version, it was a spy plane. In any event, it was not happenstance that it flew towards us." Professor William Newman, marine biologist, explains why the crab or any other sea creature theory is untenable. Even if we proceed from the supposition that crustaceans, or sharks, or something else fell upon the flesh, the skeletons should have remained. In many cases, skeletons were found on the sea or ocean floor, which had sat there for many years and, even decades. In addition, the crustaceans would not have touched bones. Also, the crab theory could not account for the lack of luggage. <laughs> Decompression theory Another explanation is provided by Izvestia correspondents Shalnev and Ilish's interview of Mikhail Igorovich Gers, captain of the Tinro II submersible which made most of the dives. In the May 31, 1991, edition of Izvestia, Capt. Gers suggested that the passengers were sucked out of the aircraft, leaving their clothes behind. Something else was inexplicable to us zipped up clothes. For instance, a coat, slacks, shorts, a sweater with zippers. The items were different, but, zipped up. And nothing inside. We came to this conclusion then, most likely, the passengers had been pulled out of the plane by decompression, and they fell in a completely different place from where we found the debris. They had been spread out over a much larger area. The current also did its work. Topic. Wind tunnel theory The latest reference to the decompression theory of the missing bodies was made by Lieutenant General Valery Kamensky, most recently Chief of Staff and Deputy Commander of the Ukrainian Air Force and formerly Chief of Staff of the Soviet Far East Military District Air Defense Force. In an article dated March 15, 2001, in the Ukrainian weekly Fakety I commentary, General Kamensky spoke about the lingering question. It is still a mystery what happened to the bodies of the crew and passengers on the plane. According to one theory, right after the rocket's detonation, the nose and tail section of the jumbo fell off and the mid-fuselage became a sort of wind tunnel so the people were swept through it and scattered over the surface of the ocean. Yet in this case, some of the bodies were to have been found during the search operations in the area. The question of what actually happened to the people has not been given a distinct answer.
Topic: Theory of Soviet removal of bodies. This theory rests on the fact that when the Soviet civilian divers first went down to the wreck just two weeks after the shootdown, the finds they encountered were contrary to an aircraft having fallen from the sky. They reportedly corresponded more to secondary placement of the wreckage, and removal of both the passengers and aircrew of Cal 007, by the Soviet Navy, who they claim had been at work prior to them, using both divers and trawlers. The first submergence was on 15 September, two weeks after the aircraft had been shot down. As we learned then, before us the trawlers had done some work in the designated quadrant. It is hard to understand what sense the military saw in the trawling operation. First drag everything haphazardly around the bottom by the trawls, and then send in the submersibles. It is clear that things should have been done in the reverse order. Captain Mikhail Igorovich Gers. Submergence 10 October. Aircraft pieces, wing spars, pieces of aircraft skin, wiring, and clothing. But no people. The impression is that all of this has been dragged here by a trawl rather than falling down from the sky. This was one of the theories expressed in the original Izvestia series of 1990-91, and the later interview of deep-sea diver Vadim Kondrabayev subsequently reprinted in English by Roy's Russian Aircraft Review. Kondrabayev, one of the civilian divers brought to explore the wreckage of Cal 007 in 1983, gave an interview to the Russian magazine Itogi, published on October 1, 2000. He points out that after he and the other civilian divers were brought to Sakhalin on September 10, 1983, they were kept there until the end of September. They literally forgot about us for several days. When they did get to the wreckage, they were surprised to find neither bodies nor luggage. Of the people who supposedly were on board, something should have remained. We worked beneath the water almost a month for five hours a day and didn't find one suitcase, not even a handle from them. After all there is baggage on any air trip. We either were able to work on the remains, which already had been filtered by the special services, or, what I also do not discount, there were no passengers at all on the airplane, and they stuffed the cabin with rubbish. It is quite possible that several mini-submarines with military divers went down to the Boeing even before us and collected everything, and scattered the remaining parts of the destroyed liner about or left them there where they were needed, and afterwards called us as a smoke screen. Topic. Theory of abduction and retention of passengers and crew The abduction theory proposes that Cal 007, having been missed by one of the missiles, landed or successfully ditched with passengers and crew surviving, they were then abducted and put into prison camps by the Soviet authorities. Among its advocates are the Israeli-American Bert Schlossberg, a son-in-law of one of the crash victims and his organization, the International Committee for the Rescue of Cal 007 Survivors, and Avraham Shifrin, a Soviet émigré to Israel in the 1970s and former Soviet prison camp inmate. It has received some coverage in the conservative news agency Accuracy in Media and also the magazine of the John Birch Society, whose second president, the Democratic representative from Georgia Larry McDonald, was a passenger on the flight. Schlossberg, as a new citizen of Israel, met Schifrin in 1989, and through Schifrin, met and questioned one of his sources, and came to question the accepted belief that the people of Cal 007 had perished. 
Through his own investigation and research of newly released documents, Schlossberg became convinced that the passengers and crew of Cal 007 had been recovered by the Russians and then imprisoned. In a self-published book and on the committee website, Schlossberg corroborates this theory with claims that Soviet military communication and cockpit voice recorder transcripts show a post-missile detonation flight path at altitude 5,000 meters for almost five minutes until over the only land mass in the Tatar Straits and within Soviet territorial waters, where it began a slow spiral descent. He claims this indicates both the aircraft's capability of extended flight, and the pilot's intention to water land near the only point where rescue would be feasible. He furthermore claims that a lack of bodies, body parts and tissues, and luggage, both on the surface of the sea and at the bottom, the Soviet obstruction of U.S., Korean, and Japanese search vessels trying to enter into Soviet territorial waters around Monoron Island, near which Cal 007 was last tracked spiraling downward. Previously unknown Soviet transcripts, released by the Russian Federation, of mission orders within one half hour of the shootdown sending helicopters, KGB patrol boats, and civilian trawlers to Monoron Island, and the Russian Federation acknowledgement of Soviet deception in its part of the search for Cal 007 all indicate a Soviet recovery of passengers and crew from the damaged and downed passenger jet. Schlossberg has also claimed that a letter sent in 1991 by Senator Jesse Helms, while he was ranking minority member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, to Russian President Boris Yeltsin, requesting information about the fate of Cal 007, indicates that Helms took the abduction theory seriously. The letter included, in a list of questions, a request to know the whereabouts of any survivors and their camp locations, and requested also to know of the fate of Larry McDonald. Schlossberg's work has not gained mainstream media attention. In a review of the circumstances of the death of Larry McDonald, University of Georgia law professor Donald E. Wilkes considered the theory as even more preposterous than Michel Brun's theory of a Japanese locale for the shootdown and an air battle having taken place between Soviet and American aircraft, Avraham Shifrin, a self-declared KGB expert, claimed that, according to the investigation of his research center, Cal 007 landed on water north of Monoron, and the passengers successfully disembarked on emergency floats. The Soviets collected them and subsequently sent them to camps with the children, separated from their parents and safely hidden in the orphan houses of one of the Soviet Middle Asian republics. McDonald in particular was supposed to have gone through a number of prisons in Moscow, among them the Central Lubyanka, and Lefertovo. The aeronautics journalist James Oberg, while acknowledging Schifrin's expertise on Soviet prison camps, has stated that Schifrin got real confused about the fate of Cal 007. Hans Ephraimson, a relative of one of the passengers, has called Schifrin a Con man who has no idea how much grief he has caused to families. Having been frustrated in his attempts to meet Schifrin's sources, according to Michel Brun, this theory is not entirely preposterous. In his book, he analyzes the first news, communicated by CIA and South Korean government, that Cal 007 landed in Sakhalin and all passengers were safe. In his careful searches, he discovered the source of this first information. It was published in a Japanese newspaper, Mainichi Shinbound, on September 1, 1983. According to him, this observation came from Wakanai radars. So, he suggests that another aircraft, probably military, landed at Sakhalin during the Sakhalin Battle and that its passengers, American, South Korean, or both, were jailed in the Soviet Union. Topic. Meekening theory 
Meekening is the term to describe the interception and rebroadcasting of navigational signals in order to confuse the sending aircraft about its own true location. There is an assumption that the target does not have secondary navigational aids such as INS or radar. This is a prelude to a deviation such as that experienced by Cal 007 on its intended course from Anchorage, Alaska, to Seoul, Korea. Meekening was used frequently during the Cold War. The theory that meekening was used against Cal 007 often entails the following points which are shown to be true from the transcripts or assumed to be true by the theory's proponents. The pilots of Cal 007 clearly believed that they were on a course different from the one that they were actually flying. Democratic Congressman Larry McDonald was known to be aboard Cal 007 and was considered the chief anti-communist in Congress, and was also the second head of the John Birch Society. Other anti-communist lawmakers were understood to have been with Larry McDonald aboard Cal 007, as it was not known that they had opted for another flight, Cal 015. These congressmen were North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms, Idaho Senator Stephen Sims, and Kentucky Representative Carol Hubbard. The intended destination and purpose of all these congressmen was ostensibly the sole celebration of the 30-year anniversary of the U.S.-South Korea Mutual Defense Treaty, but in actuality, their main purpose was to further the anti-communist coalition and activity. It is sometimes suggested that Soviet meekening of Cal 007 was performed with the tacit approval or with the active participation and planning of leftist and socialist power centers in the U.S. government. Finally, in support of the Meekin theory, this information that surfaced during the ICAO investigation and is considered indicative of purposeful intent to cause Cal 007 to go astray, at 28 minutes after takeoff, civilian radar at Kenai, on the eastern shore of Cook Inlet and 53 nautical miles 98 kilometers southwest of Anchorage, with a radar coverage of 175 miles 282 kilometers west of Anchorage, tracked Cal 007 more than 6 miles 10 kilometers north of its intended course. Cal 007 and all flights departing from Anchorage on Route J501 had to pass Cairn Mountain, which was the site of a nondirectional radio beacon NDB. An NDB navigational aid operates by transmitting a continuous three-letter identification code which is picked up by the airborne receiver, the Automatic Direction Finder ADF. Cairn Mountain was Cal 07's first assigned navigational aid out of Anchorage Airport. That night, Douglas L. Porter was the controller at Air Route Traffic Control Center at Anchorage, assigned to monitor all flights in that sector and record their observed position in relation to the fix provided by the Cairn Mountain Nondirectional Beacon. Porter later testified that all had seemed normal to him. Yet he apparently failed to record, as required, the position of two flights that night, Cal 007 and Cal 015, which followed Cal 007 by several minutes. Had he done so, it would have provided an opportunity to warn Cal 007 of its deviation, resulting in the necessary correction for the rest of the flight. To holders of the meekening theory, the above seem curious, ominous, and ancillary to their theory. Topic: U.S. government cover-up theory. Holders of this theory point to two sets of facts indicating that the U.S. government had covered up the incident and had skewed the investigation for political ends. The first set of facts relate to U.S. capability and actuality of tracking Cal 007 in its deviated flight, thus presenting the possibility of warning the aircraft in time to avert its entrance into harm's way. The Cape Nuenum and Cape Romanzoff radars monitored at the NORAD Regional Operations Command Center were but two of twelve comprising the United States Alaskan Distant Early Warning, Aircraft Control and Warning system. 
These United States Air Force radar stations at Cape Newenham and Cape Romanzoff in Alaska had the capability to track all aircraft heading toward the Russian buffer zone, though it is not known if the radar results of such outgoing tracking would have been monitored in real time at the facility at Elmendorf Air Force Base. These tapes remain unavailable to the public for national security reasons. However, there was another location at which Cal 007 could well have been tracked in its deviation. This was at the installation at King Salmon, Alaska. It is customary for the Air Force to impound radar trackings involving possible litigation in cases of aviation accidents. In the civil litigation for damages, the United States Department of Justice explained that the tapes from the Air Force radar installation at King Salmon, pertinent to Cal 07's flight in the Bethel area had been destroyed and could therefore not be supplied to the plaintiffs. At first, Justice Department lawyer Jan Van Flattern stated that they were destroyed 15 days after the shootdown. Later, he said he had misspoken and changed the time of destruction to 30 hours after the event a pentagon spokesman concurred saying that the tapes are recycled for reuse from 24 to 30 hours afterwards however the fate of cal 007 was known inside this time frame the second set of facts relate to a series of moves taking the investigation out of the hands of the national transportation safety board and in the hands of the international civil aviation organization Normally, when an airliner crashes, responsibility for the inquiry falls to the NTSB, which has the technical expertise to assess what happened. Although the downing of the Flight 007 cannot be classified as a routine aviation disaster, the NTSB office in Anchorage was notified that the plane was missing just three hours after it had come down in the Sea of Japan East sea, and immediately began to look into the matter. Shortly, after that, it was told to cease its investigation and forward to its headquarters in Washington all the material—originals and copies—it had gathered. From there, the information was sent to the State Department. James Michelangelo, chief of the NTSB's Anchorage office, was told by headquarters that the board was off the case and that the State Department would handle the investigation. Eighteen months after the airliner was shot down, when asked if the State Department had ever conducted such an inquiry, a high-level State Department official, Lynn Pascoe, replied, How is the State Department going to investigate? Holders of this theory ask why the effective investigation in progress, conducted by NTSB, Anchorage Station Chief James Michelangelo, was preempted the very first occurrence by the Washington-based NTSB Home Office under orders from the State Department, which itself did not, as originally announced, investigate the disaster, but rather referred the investigation to the political and investigatively ineffective United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization. The ICAO has no subpoena powers and, according to its mandate, can analyze only material presented to it by its constituent interested members. ICAO's final reports, it is maintained, are reflections of the politically expedient rather than of an independent investigative determination. The only other air disaster ICAO had ever investigated was the Israeli shootdown of Libyan Arab Airlines Flight 114 over the Sinai. In January 1996, Hans Ephraimson, chairman of the American Association for Families of Cal 007 Victims, claimed that South Korean President Chun Doo-won accepted $4 million from Korean Air in order to gain government protection during the investigation of the shootdown. See also Korean Airlines Flight 007 Transcripts List of airliner shootdown incidents 
Pan Am Flight 103 Conspiracy Theories MH17 Topic Notes equals equals footnotes <laughs>